welcome to a brand new episode of Seize the Moment podcast. Today, we have a very special guest. Today, we have on Dr. Vanessa Patrick. She's Professor of Marketing and the Associate Dean for Research at the Bauer College of Business at the University of Houston. Dr. Patrick has published dozens of research articles in top-tier academic journals in psychology, marketing, management, and uh, popular accounts of her work have appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, NPR, Los Angeles Times, Business Week, Fast Company, Forbes, Huffington Post, and Washington Post. And in her research, she investigates strategies to achieve personal mastery and inspire everyday excellence in oneself and others, and is a pioneer in the study of everyday consumer aesthetics. Welcome, Dr. Patrick. It's an honor to have you on. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. And so in her book, Vanessa writes, contemporary philosopher Michael E. Bratman observed that we are not frictionless de deliberators. Although today, more than a century after George Orwell shot the elephant in colonial Burma, we are so far removed from the circumstances of Orwell's story and will not be faced with the same decision he had to make. It can sometimes feel like our choices are as monumentous as that one. Yes, times have changed, yet the social pressure we experience to abide by the expectations of others can leave us feeling trapped and conflicted in much the same way as well did. Mm -hmm. All of us have likely said yes to things we wanted to say no to and succumbed to the expectations of others simply because we did not know how to refuse. Social psychologists call the tremendous power that others wield over our decisions social influence. It shapes how we respond to situations when we are under social pressure or feel under the scrutiny of others. The simplest evidence of social influence's power is our willingness to conform to what other people want of us. This often means that when we feel we are on the spot, when we feel on the spot, we will agree or say yes when it makes complete sense to say no. In Orwell's case, even years later, when he recalled the incident, the familiar pit of the stomach sensation was accompanied by an uncomfortable feeling of shame and reproach for his younger self. So super interesting because now we're kind of looking at the paradoxes of saying yes. You know, we often think of saying yes, and there's even a movie on this. I'm sure you guys have seen it called Yes, Ma'am. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, in our culture, saying yes seems like this really wonderful thing, not only just for relationships, but, you know, in terms of building or climbing the social ladder, building up status or social capital. But oftentimes when we say yes, especially in situations where we don't want to, there's a sort of paradoxical feeling of shame where we think we should have done better. We should have stood up for ourselves, et cetera. So Vanessa, can we start talking a little bit about that? And what is it that makes people, or why is it that people struggle with saying no? Why is it that people struggle with this thing that seems pretty kind of inherent existentially speaking to life? Yeah, so I write in the book that no is a harmony buster. Because for the most part, when people make a request of us, ask us a favor or invite us to go somewhere, they essentially are expecting a yes. And a no comes out of the blue for most people. And it's a socially dispreferred response in the sense that if you say no, it is going counter to what people are expecting of you. And so it becomes a huge st struggle and a huge source of conflict and anxiety for people. And so I deal with the problem of saying no when you, uh, saying yes when you want to say no. Interesting. Uh, what do you mean by that, saying yes when uh, you want to so say no? Of, sorry. A lot of people get trapped in a situation where they essentially want to say no to it, but they just don't know how, or they're really concerned about the relationship with the asker and how that might be affected or their reputation. So those three factors really influence how people respond to situations. And very often they end up saying yes when they wanted to say no. Yeah, uh, that makes sense to me, right? Uh, let's say if I was at work, a uh, boss asks me, hey, uh, Alan, uh, can you uh, please do that uh, report and uh, have it done by 3 p.m. today? And so I, feeling the social pressure, and also I want to impress my boss and mm -hmm. I want to do the best I can possibly do. Uh, yes. In my mind, I'm thinking, I think of all these different variables that might not actually lead to that deadline being met. But yes. just to impress my boss, I will say yes, and then be a, a people pleaser, right? And, but who knows, uh, maybe that wasn't the best choice, uh, best course of action. I call that the house of cards trap in my book. Yeah. So I look at uh, the fact that many people are motivated, like 
you know, in your example, motivated to say yes in the moment because it makes them look good, especially when they're trying to impress others. But what I encourage you to think about is every yes is like putting another card on a tower of cards that is becoming increasingly shaky and fragile. And I argue that dropping the ball on a commitment you have made is more damaging to your reputation than negotiating upfront an extended deadline in your case. Maybe it's better to say upfront, I don't, don't think I'm gonna be able to get it done by three this afternoon, perhaps tomorrow morning. And most likely your boss will say, sure. But by committing to three and not delivering or stressing about it all day to kind of making all the unnecessary personal sacrifices to get to 3 p.m., maybe an unnecessarily uh, an un unnecessary endeavor, which you could have avoided entirely if you had negotiated that up front. Absolutely. And oh, do you think that uh, people end up saying yes when they really mean no? It's just, it's essentially, it's it has to do with social status, right? Like they they don't want their reputation essentially to be to be tarnished. They they want to have a good reputation with with that uh, let's say boss or maybe that acquaintance, especially if they don't know that person. They want to maybe they're thinking to build a relationship, right? But would you say? Uh, and by the way, I love the book. I have actually some other comments on the book, but I guess I'll save this. But uh, would you say that not by saying no? Or essentially, by even saying uh, or negotiating how this thing can be done, essentially by placing those boundaries, it almost garners more respect from the other person. Because I imagine you keep saying yes to someone, they're going to think, oh, okay. Uh, they might not even consciously think you're a people pleaser, but subconsciously, they're going to think, oh, they can get whatever they want out of you and sort of subconsciously want to take advantage. And then maybe your value essentially, you think it's high, you're doing service for someone, right? Uh, but really, when you're doing a service for someone, it's almost like your investment in them goes up. So your your th their value to you goes up, but it doesn't mean necessarily that your value to them goes up. Yeah, I, I think you know what it is? I think just evolutionarily speaking, just as human beings, we tend to value the things that we can't really have. So when you think about value and you think about sort of rarity, like resources, right? So we tend to value more rarer resources. I mean, again, that's just a part of being a human being. So if somebody's constantly available to you, and this comes up a lot in dating, if somebody's constantly available to you, it doesn't necessarily even mean, or it doesn't matter how much you like them, right? So you'll have a person who might be highly attractive to you physically, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, they might have a lot to offer in terms of social standing. They might be even really kind and compassionate, but if they're too available, all of a sudden there's going to come that voice in your head, that little doubter that says, you know what, maybe I'm wrong about this person. Maybe they're not as great. Maybe there's something behind the scenes. And I think it's kind of a hard thing to shake. So this happens a lot of the times. And I don't want to kind of get away from your point because I know you're more so talking about this, like from a, or in a work culture, but this comes up a lot in dating too, where if a person is too available, no matter how much they have to offer, you know, seemingly on paper, it doesn't necessarily matter. It turns the other person off. Hmm. People who are, you know, high status people and people who have achieved a great deal in their lives very often recommend that we learn to say no to the things that are not aligned with our purpose, that are not consistent with our values. And they have learned that through their own life experiences. And essentially, think if we think about the people we admire, we actually admire people who have very clear ideas about what they will do and what they won't do, what they invest in and what they don't. So contrary to our intuition that our reputation would be damaged and our rep relationships would suffer, we actually we are actually able to demonstrate with the research that that is Quite the opposite. When you establish yourself with very clear personal policies, which are these simple rules that guide your actions and decisions, you are seen as having much more determination conviction, and conviction and come across as way more persuasive.
Yeah, I love that. So again, going back to, again, I like to kind of look at this from an evolutionary slash uh, psychiatric or psychological standpoint or perspective. So uh, my thinking is, okay, so we tend to have a, a sort of repugnance toward letting people down or disappointing people. I think this is a pretty natural human trait. Like, you know, I don't want to let Alan down because I don't want Alan to be upset with me. You know, maybe the idea is like, okay, catastrophic thinking will tell me maybe he'll ostracize me from the group or for our friendship. Yeah. And then therefore, that's it. I've lost Alan as a friend. So oftentimes when we think about it in those in those terms, it seems like not just a short-term benefit, but even a long-term benefit where the thinking again, in catastrophic thinking terms, we think, well, I mean, I don't want to lose him then, but I also don't want to lose him now. So how is it that we kind of start to, uh, how is it that we can start to kind of get out of that mindset and start to reframe some of these thoughts? So if there are particular steps, and I'm now thinking more like in CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy terms, but of course you can have a different way of doing it. So what are the sort of steps that now we can take to get somebody out of that type of thinking? Because on the one hand, you know, what you're saying is that the reason research shows that actually you'll be probably, let's say, we can't say for sure, but probably you'll be more respected, more likely than not, if you were able to say no or better able to. But then on the other hand, you have this kind of innate fear that says, yeah, I, I think this is wrong, you know, because my gut is telling me absolutely not. I can't say no because these terrible things are going to happen. And I've had patients tell me that. I've had, so I'm a psychotherapist and I've had patients tell me like, no, 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 you don't understand. If I tell my friend, no, she's never going to want to talk to me ever again. And it's really hard to convince them otherwise. Very quickly. Uh, in your book, right, you you have a system, uh, or rather an acronym, ART, right? Yeah. Uh, are you able to uh, speak on that and then how that relates to his question? Absolutely. Uh, so the ART of Empowered Refusal, the ART, stands for aware. the three competencies that drive this phenomenon or the con key construct that the book is centered around, which is empowered refusal. So empowered refusal is a way of saying no that stems from your identity and gives voice and value to your priorities, preferences, and beliefs. And because you look inwards and say no based on who you are and your authentic self, you will come across as much more persuasive. So that's kind of the, the uh, psychological mechanism that underlies the... Uh, the, the reason why empowered refusal works. And so in the book, I outline three competencies that we need to develop in order to be able to practice empowered refusal. And the first is, uh, stands for, A stands for awareness, R stands for rules, not decisions, and T stands for totality of self. Mm -hmm. So we can walk through each of them. The first competency is, is to develop deepened a great deepened self-awareness because it is only through reflection and self-knowledge that we are able to articulate for ourselves what our values are, what our priorities are, where our beliefs lie and what our preferences are, how we want to live in this world, essentially. So knowing that, having that self-knowledge and equipped with that, we can move on to the second competency, which is developing a set of simple rules, which I call personal policies, by which you create a structure or an architecture from which you can say no. So once you have established a set of decision rules or rituals that shape your actions and behaviors, you are better equipped to say no when asks come your way. And the, and the third competency is to uh, think about empowered refusal as an act of communication. And because it is an act of communication, it's got both verbal as well as nonverbal elements. The verbal elements is what we studied a lot when we talked about empowered refusal. And that involves the use of empowered language, you know, replacing words, disempowered words like I can't with empowered language like I don't. Uh, but accompanying those empowered words is the importance of bringing non-verbal cues to the table. You know, talking with, with open gestures, leaning forward, smiling, uh, you know, uh, using, using gestures that make a person feel comfortable. I think the essence of a good refusal is that a person gets, the asker gets that their, if your refusal is about your values and it's about you and not a rejection of them. 
Yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. And now going back and sort of framing this in CBT terms, we often, when we talk about reframing, we all, we help the person, you know, sometimes the patient, sometimes just another person. We help them see that, okay, this is what's actually going on internally when somebody is saying no. And this is, you know, even what's going on with you when you're saying no. So let's say if there's a person who's afraid of saying no, I would often ask, okay, what are you, what, if, first of all, tell me your experience, right? Why are you telling this person no? And they would say something along the lines of, well, you know, I feel like I'm really bombarded with work. I have a lot of stuff going on. Uh, I have a bunch of commitments etc. Right. And I say, okay, so your thinking is that the person wouldn't be able to appreciate that. And that person will say, well, I mean, that's kind of been my past experience. I feel like a lot of people take it personally and I actually have lost friends. Right. And then I would say, okay, so let's go through that. What do you think the person is thinking? And they would say, well, the person is thinking, maybe I don't value them. Maybe uh, I don't consider them to be a priority. And I would ask, okay, but is that true? And they would say, well, no, absolutely not. I mean, maybe they're not the highest priority, but they're definitely a priority. Let's say they're in the top three or top four, but definitely num not number one or number two. And then I would say, okay, and you don't think based on what you know on, about your friendship that this person would be able to understand. And then maybe we'll go through experiences and pieces of evidence where there were so where there were kind of parts or uh, let's say some discord between the two. And maybe the person would say, well, actually, no, there have been moments where that person has understood uh, when, let's say, I let them down in other instances or, you know, through other kind of uh, moments or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so what you kind of see is that, okay, this sort of belief that maybe a person can't handle no is actually kind of misguided. Maybe in the way that you can sometimes handle no, not always, obviously, because you're a human being, maybe the other person can handle no too. And so I like this idea of sort of cultivating empathy between the two parties, where we can see that no doesn't actually mean what you think it does. So it doesn't mean that the person hates you, you know, in the more extreme form of it. And it doesn't even necessarily mean that the person doesn't prioritize you. And I like that you said, when you say no, and you frame it correctly, essentially, you're because you're saying it based on your own values, right? Mm -hmm that keeps it from being something that that person can take personally, yes. right? Because they're, they're expecting that, that yes, right? Uh, but when you frame it as no, 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 uh, just based on my values, I won't be uh, doing this. That's yeah. very interesting to me, because I feel like the delivery and the structure and the framing is, is incredibly vital, the, the way that you outline it in the book, um, to actually making sure that that no for lack of a better way of putting it, hits correctly. Right, yeah. precisely. And so, you know, it's about, about uh, and, and, and I think one of the things that I highly recommend for most people it, it is, is to never say no in the heat of the moment because it takes time to construct an empowered refusal. It's very hard in the heat of the moment to respond, you know, with that precision. And that's why I try to buy time and to kind of think about why is it, why is it that I want to say no? Most people, when they are faced with this sort of request, feel like under the glare of a spotlight and feel compelled to act immediately. Uh, but if you can just hold back with some restraint and buy some time, think about it and frame your refusal to be more precise. So I don't know whether you remember this one study where I looked at personal policies versus excuses. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really important study in this context because when we are when we respond in the heat of the moment, we kind of grab the first available excuse and we just say it, right? Whereas a personal policy requires you to reflect reflect why do i want to say no what values are being uh, am i not upholding by saying yes and therefore how can i construct my refusal to the other person so as to reflect those values and and make it about me not about them that takes time so what i what i did in a study is i divided participants into two groups and I told them that they that they had a friend who uh, asked them to borrow some money uh, or, or rather they asked that friend to borrow some money so hey you you, you need money you asked a friend you know can I borrow five thousand uh, dollars for for to buy a to put a down payment on an apartment or something like that and uh, their friend responds either with an excuse which says oh you know uh, I have to pay my tuition and I'm, I've got some financial constraints at the moment so that's kind of an excuse versus a personal policy which is I don't loan money to friends and family I just stay away from it and what we found is that in the short run like right now both are effective excuses work and personal policies work 
But the key question that we asked was five years later, imagine you needed money. Would you go back to this friend? Hmm. It turns out because an excuse is by definition short lived, you're Hmm. more likely to go and ask the friend who used an excuse. But a person who uses a personal policy conveys a long, enduring stance on a matter, you're less likely go, to go and ask them. I think that's pretty powerful because you, your values are who you are. And it doesn't matter whether it's now, five days from now, or now or five years from now, your stance on a matter does not change. And people wow. respond to that. Yeah, I love that so much because oftentimes, and I make this mistake all, all the time. So uh, business-wise, uh, with friends, with past friends, where somebody would message me and I would just say, oh, hey, no, oh, I can't right now. I'm so busy. And then the person would be like, okay. And then like a month later, oh, hey, man, how are you doing? I'm like, no, oh my God, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just so busy. And the thinking is obviously, I probably don't intend on really talking to this person anymore, but I don't want to let them down and hurt their feelings. And this comes up, I would say, in business as well, where there are certain times where I just, uh, there are clients that I just don't really work well with and I could tell. And so I've gotten much better at this over the years. And I would say, well, I don't, I'm not really good with these particular diagnoses. So I'm not the best therapist for this. But b- before that, I would just pretty much say, oh, well, no, you know, I don't think I can right now, or, you know, I'm just really full or really busy or whatever. And yet people will consistently come back to you. And I think that I actually do this to, and I think that people actually do this to me too. And I can remember even with like, when you're pursuing people in dating and people tell you, oh, well, no, not now I'm really busy. And you're thinking, okay, great. I'll reach out to you in like two months. And this happens and with our podcast by the way and now that i'm even thinking about it, this is like the worst thing with our podcast so so i i pretty much do a lot of like uh the networking and sort of a booking or whatever so there there will be somebody occasionally this doesn't happen frequently but where somebody will say okay i'm really interested or i'm interested please reach back out to me in x amount of time great I'm like, oh, you got it. I write it down, forget about it. Then I reach out to them again. So either they don't get back to me at all or they say, oh, hey, no, I'm so sorry. I'm really busy. And I'm like, dude, like, come on. You could have just told me that you didn't want to do it. I was like, I'd rather at that point prefer somebody to ghost me altogether. Yeah, yeah. to ghost me altogether than just do that. I wonder about that, though. Hmm. The, I, there might actually be a subtle sort of gray area. Shoot, there. I'd love to hear it. Well, I mean, for instance, and I, I don't know, Vanessa, maybe you would agree. If maybe somebody did ask you uh, or asked you to do something or maybe to hang out and you said, uh, I can't right now, right? Well, yes, I agree. It's not a firm no. Yes, it's a short-lived excuse. So they will- Oh, I have an you. answer for this, but go ahead. But what if, is it possible that uh, you could be thinking when you do say I can't right now, you know, may- maybe I'll actually consider it later, but right now. I'm yeah, just... I have an answer for this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. OK. <laughs> OK. So what I what I think and obviously, look, I'm probably mind reading here, but here's the thing. I've seen enough of a pattern to think that this is a thing. What I think is going on, I think the probability is incredibly low, uh, low. And what I think these folks are doing are they're stringing you along. So what they're essentially saying is that even though I think there's maybe a 10 to 20 percent chance that I'm going to do this, I don't want to outright say no, just in case a slot opens up, just in case something happens. And, you know, what do I have to to lose anyway, right? Who cares? You reach back out to me. I don't have to put in any effort. There's minimal investment on my end. So that is literally the definition of stringing somebody along. It's saying like, hey, hey, I'm really busy now. But if I mean, if you reach out to me later, who knows? You know, pro- the world is kind of like, you know, your oyster in some sense. You could do whatever, you know, anything can happen. So that's what I think is happening. That's why I don't appreciate that. So my thinking is, if you know that the probability is low, and look, hey, if you say that, and I've actually, some people have said that to me, where they said, look, you know, I'm really busy for like the next year. I mean, there's some chance that something might open up, but I don't want to get your hopes up. You know, if you want, please feel free to reach out. Great. I love that. Oh my God. So now I could actually make an informed decision. But otherwise, when it's like, oh, first of all, they're letting me know I'm interested, which Mm -hmm. means that the chances are pretty high when you say I'm interested. Yeah. (laughs) And then on top of that, it's saying like, well, here's sort of the timeline for you. Great. So I'm interested. Here's the timeline. My thinking is this must work out, right? Or at least again, there's a good chance of it. So yeah, I don't appreciate that because it's not an outright lie, but it's uh, it's a misconception. That's what's a misconception on my part. But it's also, uh, what would you call it? It's, it's a mistruth. I don't want to say it's a lie, but it's sort of a mistruth. And there's some slight deception involved, which I really don't appreciate. So in the book, I talk about this notion of the acquaintance trap. And yeah. I think a lot of you are talking, uh, I mean, a lot of the examples you were giving is because we have these kind of weak ties with a whole bunch of people that we, we are unsure where we stand with them. We want to maintain good relationships. We want to keep in touch. Uh, but, and, and we feel unsure about where we stand. So it becomes much harder to say, uh, say no to them. 
So I, sh I show in the book that, you know, it's really easy, or much easier to say no to somebody who's a complete stranger who you're never going to see again, right? Someone asks you for, for, for money at the grocery store and never going to see them again, easy to just say, sorry, not today or something like that. We can also say no to people who, with whom we have much stronger relational ties. So like our mom and our sister or whatever, because we, have, we, we are secure in those relationships. So saying no is not going to affect our reputation or our relationship with that person. Right. But the vast majority of people fall in the bucket of acquaintances and that's where we struggle you know and especially when they are these kind of uh, acquaintances you who you are meeting online like uh, who who don't know you and so they kind of string you along as we just talked about because they are they are working in the same kind of trap as you they they are trying to assess where they stand and they don't want to look bad. They, they, don't, they don't want to make you feel bad or have you lose face. And so there's this constant um, negotiation that happens. And I think, you know, being speaking from a place of values and actually really thinking through where do I stand on this matter? And so I have this two by two framework that's in the book called where I help people think about deciphering the ask. And that's a pretty useful kind of way to figure out immediately and categorize. This is a no, this is a yes, this is a think about. Oh, can right. you tell us a little bit about that? How does the process yeah. work? So um, thinking about the fact that, you know, sometimes no's are, uh, sometimes no's are really hard to say and, that, and yeses can be hugely costly. We have to weigh our, the decisions. And so I, I uh, come up with a, two by two where one axis of the of the framework is the cost to you how costly is it for you to do the ask right? how much effort energy time resources do you have to invest mm -hmm. uh, and on the other hand how much benefit does the other person get from you doing what they asked like and is it something that you can uniquely do? If you can, you're the only person who can do this and it's a huge benefit for the other person, then it's something to consider. If anyone could do it and you're just like, you just happen to be the person that they caught to, to, to grab to do it in the moment, then the benefit to them is low. So the two by two is if, if it's low cost, high benefit, I call it the pass the salt asks. Uh, so imagine you're sitting at a dining table, the salt shaker is in front of you, someone asks for the salt, you lift it and you give it to them. For you, it's been really very, very little effort, but for them, it might be a game changer in terms of the taste of their meal. So uh, the past the salt ask are typically yeses, right? Because very little effort for you, huge benefit for others. As long as you don't fill your day with past the salt asks, you're 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 pretty uh, well off. And you know, an example of a past the salt ask, as a professor at least, is writing recommendation letters for a student. So if I write a recommendation letter for a student, I have a process in place. I know how long it takes. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward task for me, routine. But for a student, it wouldn't. It it really makes a huge difference. It can be right. uh, something that could help them get into college, their dream school, medical school, or law school, or something like that. And so I tend to think about those asks as yes, you should try and do them as far as possible. The complete opposite of that is what I call bake your favorite famous lasagna. Asks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> bake your famous lasagna asks are these asks that are very irresponsible because people have asked you to do it without really thinking about the effort involved. You know, hey, I'm having a party. Can you bake your famous lasagna? You are having a party and you're asking me to spend hours baking my famous lasagna? That's a huge ask to be for, for my dish to be amongst all the potluck dishes on the table. Those are asks that I think should be outright no's. I mean, mm. they they do not merit, they are not unique to you. You do not create any unique value by doing that. And they do not really make, they're not hugely important for the asker either. I mean, it wouldn't matter with that person, whether you brought a party tray from the local grocery store 
or baked your lasagna. I mean, effort-wise, yeah. it's good for you for the food for the party. No difference. So, uh, so, so you know, those are two, and then there's the other one, which I think is really important, where you really need to think about taking it on and asking questions. I call those heroes' journey asks because they are huge effort for you, but they also create great value for the asker. So you are here, you are in these situations, you really need to invest effort in figuring out upfront whether your your whether the benefit that you perceive the other person is getting is real. Number one. Two is that you are the only and unique person who can deliver that benefit. Like that's a huge cost to you, but can are you the only one? And so asking questions and figuring it out before you jump to a yes is quite important for these heroes journey asks. So, you know, even though it's so funny because so many people think, oh, she's the queen of no, she says no to everything. Absolutely not. <laughs> you, have to, you, have to, you have to say no to the things that do not matter and yes to everything else because everything is a trade-off. I mean, you have to think about the fact that if you say yes to something, you are saying no to something else. And I think about that all the time. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you yeah, know, I love that. Something to learn. Yeah, that's interesting. You, uh, do, do you want, uh, uh, so that's interesting. Yeah, th there is an opportunity cost, right? Trade offs, right? Uh, I, I totally agreed. I wonder what's the balance between because here's the thing: uh, many, especially in uh, in psychology, or I guess you could say in self help culture, mm -hmm. you could say that there's this uh, there's a lot of concentration around giving value or being a giver right? Mm -hmm. And essentially, oh, if you uh, give and you give and you give, uh, it'll yield this emergent, beautiful value in your life. It, it can it can lead you to places you cannot even imagine, right? By offering so much value. <laughs> now, I wonder when you're asking questions, right? About, let's say a big ask, right? Am I the only one who can do this for this person? Is there anyone else who can do it? How much will they benefit from this and doing that cost benefit analysis? Is that really, I suppose, the main way to sort of gauge or make make that dis like here's the thing? Because on one level, you want to give value. So this way, um, you know, it's it's also genuine. You also want to benefit from it selfishly, probably, but um, it's a good thing to do. But at the same time, I guess I suppose if you did that all the time, oh, uh, you wouldn't have any. Uh... Yeah, I... yeah. Please, no. Hey, can I add to that? Yeah. Thank so you. you know what I was thinking when uh, we're both now we're both of you were talking. So what happens where you start sort of as they call it, you know, buying into your own hype? So this actually happens a lot in my field, and this has happened to me several times. So where I couldn't take on the patient, that the person's like, no, but you don't understand. You are the best therapist, and you know my ego is like, oh my god, I provide so much <laughs> value for this person. I'm the best therapist, sure. and of course, I mean that's silly, right? So I mean there are plenty of competent therapists. So I think what you're saying is like, you know. Uh, well, it's a little bit different than what I'm saying, but I think it's very, it can kind of be intertwined in the sense that, okay, on the one hand, you know, you want to provide so much value, right? But how do you actually kind of like assess when it actually is and isn't a lot of value? Because a lot of times, I mean, you have emotional connections to these things. Like therapy is a great example, right? So I, I mean, look, I know my competencies as a therapist, and I promise you a lot of times I'm not doing anything outside of what some regular CBT therapist is doing. And I, I, I could look back on those sessions and I could say, I know what we talked about. It wasn't that great. So, you know, when the person and says like, oh my God, I need to see you. I'm like, okay, dude, something else is going on around here, you know? Uh, so yeah, so the thinking is, it's like, how do you kind of also stop yourself from, uh, kind of, or how do you have an accurate assessment of the situation and actually how much value you do provide? And I guess what you're saying is that whether it's even worth providing a lot of value. Well, so here's the thing. So, and Vanessa, please cor correct me if I'm wrong. It seems to be that when you couple that awareness with that cost benefit analysis, I suppose with the awareness, you can gauge um, how much, or rather, you can you can gauge that. Oh, I uh, it's good to offer value. It's good to be a giver, right? Yeah. And uh, you may even identify as a giver, right? Uh, if you're using a noun, let's say to describe yourself. And if you're narcissistic, <laughs> well, okay, sure. <laughs> but then, uh, then the cost benefit analysis is determining. Oh, how much time, energy can I give to this task? 
in relation to all other tasks that I have to do because of all these different trade-offs. So the awareness yeah. and the cost benefit analysis seem to yeah. go Absolutely. together. I think the awareness drives, so it, it re, you require some awareness to both internal self-awareness and external self-awareness to be able to assess those two dimensions of the matrix, right? You need to know for yourself, what, what am I capable of giving? What resources do I have available to give? And then, of course, how much does the other person benefit from the from uh, from all this effort? And and if you, I feel that if you don't know and you can't assess, it's better to ask and to be conservative. So I very often kind of talk in my classes, and I teach a women in leadership program, the lead faculty for women in leadership program, and women particularly tend to feel very much like givers. So we see a very clear. Uh, you know, a gender difference in terms of uh, the, the need to be communal and give of yourself. And, and a lot of women feel like the world would fall down if I didn't do this, my community would suffer. And I think one of the most humbling things I've learned through this research is when people, when you say no to somebody and the spotlight is on you, when you say no, the spotlight just shifts to somebody else. Mm, yeah. People do not necessarily get stuck and say you're the only person in the world who can do it as soon as you develop the humility to say well you know I, that's that that's nice of you to say but that's not actually always true that the spotlight most often just shifts i mean think about the last time we asked somebody for something they said no and the next thing we thought about who's on the next on our list that's it that's how that's how we operate so most things it's a pretty straightforward thing you say no they just move on to somebody else right and one thing i just i really love about your book it's it's incredibly simple yet intricate it's the the fact that you're there, there's parts in the book where you're able to sort of score yourself on, you know, for example, people pleasing, yeah. right? Uh, there will be five different uh, maybe scenarios and score from zero to five. And then mm -hmm. you'll say from, you know, uh, least agree to most agree, essentially. And then uh, depending on how your scores add up, oh, if it's between zero and nine, oh, you're not people pleasery. Great uh nine to, sorry 10 to 19 uh okay you care about what other people think uh, however you can benefit from the tools in the book and then if you score over 20 okay you are a people pleaser please please read please stop book. pleasing exactly yeah. essentially That's yeah. not talking. i mean the number of people in our research that would actually say i am a people pleaser and uh like one of the things I'm, I, I feel pretty strongly about is not giving yourself this sort of label. Because the more we give ourselves labels, the more we kind of make those pathways that are in our identity that say, this is who I am. Uh, and so I highly recommend people talking about the fact that they have a tendency to please, but not that they are. Because as soon as you use nouns to describe yourself, it becomes much more part of your identity. It's much better to say, hey, you know, I tend to people please. That's a verb. You're less likely to do it if you, if you describe yourself uh, using verbs compared to nouns. That's interesting, actually. That, that, that connects to something else in the book, too. Uh, the idea of, uh, so actually, how do affirmations relate to being able to build your ability to to say no uh, in an empowered way? Right. I think that I, I think uh, you're referring to the part of the book where I was talking about self-talk and the importance of being able to, uh, I mean, if you think about it, the, we, we spend the most time with ourselves and our brain is constantly talking to us about what we are thinking, who we are, what we feel, what we like. And so uh, what we've shown in our research is that sometimes using empowered refusal as self-talk can be a really effective self-regulation strategy. So we can set ourselves up for success and achieve our goals by talking to ourselves in a way that's empowered. So for example, saying, you know, I don't eat chocolate cake makes you more likely not to eat chocolate cake than if you say, I can't eat chocolate cake. I don't take the elevator when I can take 
the stairs makes you more likely to uh, take the stairs because that's in you know, a goal for exercise. Um, you know, so so basically, I the, what what we talk about in the book, what I talk about in the book is the research on how empowered refusal can be used as an effective tool to self regulate. Yeah. And what I love is that you have a, a part of the book where you mentioned the movie Runaway Bride and the Julia Roberts character. I, I, don't, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie. Yeah. yeah. So the Julia Roberts character who essentially doesn't even really fundamentally know who she is. And what's so interesting is in my practice, I see that a lot of times with people who are, uh, I mean, they're definitely people pleasers, but it's this fundamental part too, where they take things or they sort of take on things that they don't necessarily want. And when you kind of ask them like, hey, what is it that you really want? Or what is it that you're attracted to? Yeah, they don't really know and they can't answer the question. So it's like, uh, so here's an interesting, uh, I guess, scenario without giving too much specifics. I remember asking a person, I said, okay, uh, what is it about this person that you like? And the response was like, well, they were just really persistent. And I'm like, huh, that's like a reason to date somebody is just that they were persistent. And they were like, yeah, like, I mean, it seemed like they really like me. So ultimately what you see is that if you can chalk it up to anything, the understanding is I like this person simply because they liked me, which is obviously a really poor foundation for a relationship. So how do we kind of begin to address this where you really have the person thinking that being attracted to somebody or being in a stable, healthy, romantic relationship actually just means being liked by the person. It's just that simple. So I'm not, I, I'm not a relationship expert, yeah. but in my framework, it boils down to developing the self-awareness, understand investing. I mean, people just taking time to be alone and reflect on what you care about what your values, priorities, preferences, and beliefs are, what you want to bring to the world and what is the best possible life for you. So many people don't actually know that. And so a lot of the work that I do in my women leadership classes is give people the time and even the permission to think about and reflect on themselves, what their values are. And one of the activities we do is also look at your calendar and look at whether the way you are spending your time is uh, consistent with your values. Like, are you living the life that you wanna live based mm -hmm. on how your calendar is structured? And it's simple things like that that can be like massive eye-opening experiences because you're not really thinking, you're thinking in the future, I will be this person who does, uh, lives according to their values. In the moment, I'm just in this crisis mode. And so a lot of the reflection has to come from truly understanding uh, who you are. So one of the exercises that we do is the best self-reflective, uh, best reflective self-exercise. Uh, I don't know whether you've heard about that, but it's really doing a 360 on you, like, uh, uh, asking people who are close to you to report on when you were at your best self. And sometimes it's good, kind of eye-opening for people to hear what other people say that is their best are they, when they are operating at their best, because we often take for granted the stuff that we do well, and we don't really leverage them as assets. So the fact that let's say you're organized or you're punctual, these are things that we take for granted about ourselves because, you know, yeah, that's what you, that's how you operate. But those are huge assets. Those are your values, the way you operate in the world. And so recognizing that and uh, putting, put, putting these personal policies around that. So I developed a framework, which I call the dream framework, which is right. in the book on how you set up and establish these personal policies. And it can be pretty useful. One of the things that you know work a lot for women is developing personal policies around self-care. Uh, because, you know, running around, don't have time to do anything, don't invest in even taking the 15 minutes to meditate or breathe or read a nice book or just lie down and watch a nice a movie for a little while. I mean, these are small things. Uh, um, and I've published some really cool research on simple pleasures, which is, you know, uh, which I which I feel is really important for people to embrace. They don't have to be hugely costly or expensive things. They just have to be things that you take a moment to recognize and appreciate, and they can fill you with, uh, you know, positive energy, and then give you give you the motivation to pursue the things that are important to you.
No. Yeah. And something that also works with me and again, going back to my practice. So when you're thinking about self-care, a lot of times uh, for somebody who is, who would label themselves as a people pleaser, who has that tendency, the thinking is, well, it's really hard for me because of my values for me to let go of that and for me to do something for myself. So a lot of times what we do is we kind of reconceptualize it and reframe it. And we look at it in terms of how is this actually now going to be a help for your community? So let's say if you take an hour out of the day, you know, to, I don't know, go watch a movie or uh, to take a, even a bath, right? Something that simple or, you or know, gym. Yeah. Or yep. go to the gym, right? Something for yourself, right? How would that actually help you in the long run, right? So you're this person who has a deep need to service your community. Obviously, you're really important to these people. But in terms of, let's say, the opposite, if you're burning out, uh, if you're struggling to maintain your mental health, if your people are finding that you're constantly, let's say, tired, uh, you have issues with your physical health, right? How are you going to really maintain that? And so oftentimes, it's sort of a light bulb for that person where they think, oh, wow, yeah, you're right. So there's no real way for me to actually do anything for other people if I don't do for myself. So it's that like oxygen, giving yourself the oxygen yeah. mask before you can help others, right? And I think it boils down to that uh, in on a daily basis as well. Yeah, yeah. And it, it seems to be that many people run on automatic, right? They don't take the time to reflect, right? That's probably why some people they were looking at their calendar, how their day is structured, how their month is structured, and then probably having those eye-opening experiences because. How often do we take the time to reflect unless unless you're meditating or maybe working with a therapist or maybe reading your book, which makes you kind of reflect on how how you're being as a person, you don't actually look at yourself that often in the mirror, right? And I, I actually, I really appreciate that the, that the book that essentially does that and the people that you, you're talking about, right? This is not, a, of course, all across the board, but... Uh, it seems to be that a lot of people live a sort of uh, reactive strategy to life in the sense that they're sort of in a, in a survival. Yeah, it's based on fear. Yep. That's yeah. It. It's essentially like, oh, uh, I have this current stressor. So mind is going to focus on that right now. I can't think of any other variables outside of this situation right now. Uh, I'm so zoned in. It's like a narrow sort of focus, but not, not the good kind of narrow focus. Yeah. It's, it's not flow. It's not, flow. it's not flow. It's not flow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, essentially, yeah, no, that that's essentially why I, I definitely like the book. It even made me think about, um, kind of myself. Uh, I, I have a, I have a tendency to be borderline people pleasing in the mm -hmm. sense that, uh, cause I, I read a, a lot of books, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, maybe conflict resolution, uh, mm -hmm. how to sort of, um, avoid uh, maybe negative situations or misunderstandings, which is mm -hmm. all well and good. There is a there is something uh, beautiful to that, right? But then I suppose I could see how I've leaned into uh, maybe. So I don't mind conflict, but I could I could argue if I had to be objective that I do kind of lean towards trying not to get into conflict because I'm seeking that understanding. So it's a hard distinction to sort of make, but I, I do like that the book actually got me thinking about my own behaviors and also thinking about, oh, maybe, hey, uh, I could work on how I'm structuring and, and framing, um, let's say, uh, my empowered refusals. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, You know, when I, I, I often think about when, when dealing with other people, uh, the importance of values and, and coming up with, um, you know, it's almost like whenever you're in a situation that it could be potentially a conflicting situation or maybe a little bit contentious to kind of go to a higher order level of thinking and think, what do we have in common? What do we both care about in this situation? And, you know, creating and, and inviting the other person to kind of put their feet in the same pool of shared meaning. So yeah. once you both have your feet in the pool of shared meaning and your your conversation is elevated to a higher level, a higher order level, the conflict just dissipates because then you are having a much more constructive and meaningful dialogue about how to resolve a particular issue as opposed to a contentious head on head, head on head conflict if that makes any sense oh no totally totally like uh, essentially seeking first to understand then to be understood you may you may frame yeah. what it is that they just said to you and see if uh with them did i understand this correctly oh they now feel that you understood them 
So therefore, oh, now I feel understood. There's more trust and rapport towards you. And now you have something that you wanted to say. And then there's this sort of harmonious uh, dynamic as opposed to I'm right, you're wrong, yes, no, and this polarizing sort of uh, dynamic. Totally, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 In the book, I talk, I talk about some research that talks about the importance of, uh, of repeating what the other person says as a form of listening. And as soon as you do that, you show respect that you understood what the person said, but you also, so if someone asks you something, very often we don't even take the time to think about what that ask really is. We are so quick to jump to either a yes or a no or some decision. Sometimes it's important to just uh, clarify what the ask really is. And mm. uh, in some situations, you know, you could probably just resolve it. Um, you know, so in the last type of ask in that two by two that we talked about are the asks that where in, I call them email tweet post asks, which are essentially asks that, that sh should are uh, useless. They are not worth doing. They're not worth investing any effort in. And in those situations, it's so important for us to identify that it is not worth doing because and, and provide that input through dialogue. You know, I thought about this. I, th I know you asked me to do this, but is this something that anyone should do? Mm. And it turns out very often, a lot of the things that can be resolved, I call them bullshit jobs in the book. <laughs> but yeah. Bullshit jobs don't need to be done. Nobody needs to do a bullshit job. It's not about you. You're doing the, the, the universe a favor. If you, if you can resolve the bullshit job problem with a dialogue as opposed to have, have it passed along to the next person. Mm -hmm. I love that. But I am curious how we can kind of start to think about this. What happens when you have somebody who is high conflict and who does tend to personalize mm -hmm. and yeah, for whom it is, you know, they have very thin skin and for whom it is difficult to, for them to take no or a no. Hmm. Yes. So that's chapter that's chapter seven in the book. Hmm. Uh, the pushy asker, right? Someone hmm. who will not take no for an answer. Uh, in my book, I call them walnut trees mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, because the black, uh, the American black walnut tree is, uh, is uh, has a beautiful is a beautiful tree with a luxuriant canopy, and it essentially dominates the landscape. And the way it does that is by exuding in the soil a toxin called jaglone, and essentially stunts the growth of everything else. Mm -hmm. So instead of calling these people, you know, in the literature, these people are called jerks or assholes or whatever it is i decide to call them walnut trees because they do essentially those those same things uh so in our classes we say oh yeah that's a walnut tree mm -hmm. uh and uh so so you know walnut trees are the kind of people who will not take no for an answer they will insist on you giving them a response right away they want an immediate response they often ask you stuff face to face because we are 33 times more likely to say yes to a face to face request. Walnut trees know that. They also create a home court advantage for themselves. So they might, you know, call you to their home or their office or take you out for lunch. So they've created this artificial power dynamic that kind of corners you so that you can't say no. So recognizing and spotting walnut trees and learning their strategies is an is an essential skill to make empowered refusal work in the real world. Uh, so I obviously have a whole range of strategies uh, to deal with walnut trees. Some deal with direct confrontation. So invoking a personal policy, repeating your no again and again and again till the walnut tree just goes away. Uh, but there are other indirect strategies that you could use um, that, that kind of put a barrier or distance yourself from the walnut tree. Uh, you could, for instance, uh, delegate your no to somebody else if there's a way to kind of have someone else. And a lot of powerful people have, you know, the bad guy who, mm -hmm. who said, says the no's while they remain the good guy. So they pay good cop, bad cop. The bad yeah. cop says the no, the good, the, the good cop gets to not have to deal with that. So that's definitely a strategy. Uh, putting Using technology is a great strategy. So I talk about technology as a buffer. So it's much easier to say no via email or in a text message than to say no in person. Sometimes you have to know, use non-verbals like a thumbs down emoji may work better than any 
uh, language that you would use. So I think you have to work harder with walnut trees, but it's certainly not impossible. I love that. Yeah, I've gotten used to blocking people, especially lately. I'm just like, man. So my thinking is, and I love this, uh, I guess it's a phrase or comment or whatever. Silence is an answer. And a lot of people will not understand that. So they will ask you something and you just won't respond. And you're like, cool, I'm moving on. Then they will ask you another question or the same question again. And you're like, damn, dude, like you don't get it. I don't want to talk to you. Like clearly I'm not responding for a reason. So yeah, I just have to start blocking people. Fair enough. Uh, so just to uh, shift it a little bit, Ear earlier on in our conversation, you mentioned that um, to take some time to structure how you're going to frame your no, right? If, if you can. Um, what's a sort of a, a strategy, I suppose? Let's say you're dealing with um, a, maybe a friend. Honestly, I'll generalize it. Friend, family member, or maybe colleague. And you need to get have that. They asked you something. You need that time to say no. Um, what's something that I suppose could be said in order to gain that time? Uh, like I'll get back to you essentially, or so you know, essentially not committing in the moment. So you could say, I need some time to think about this, yes. or. Ideally, in an ideal world, you already have practiced, you know, developed these competencies and you have a set of personal policies in place so mm -hmm. that you can immediately identify this is a yes, this is a no, this is, you know, I need a thing to think about. And so once you kind of start practicing, you become much better at being able to respond appropriately in the situation. You don't always have to ask for time if you know what the response is going to be. So if someone tells me, you know, I, I know for myself that I am very much a scholar and, you know, I love learning about stuff and I love sharing my knowledge, right? So let's say that my daughter's teacher has an ask and she says, you know, will you come to the class and talk about, you know, your experience traveling to a particular place on your Fulbright? I don't need time to think about that. To me, it's 100% no, a yes, mm -hmm. because it aligns with all my priorities. I get to teach, I get to share my knowledge, I get to do, uh, you know, what is unique to me. I'm sharing mm -hmm. something unique to me. I don't need time. It would be 100% yes on the spot. On the other hand, if she said, come and stuff envelopes because we need people to stuff envelopes, while I, I totally respect you know, envelope stuffing, that's not something that I want to do. And I don't even have to think twice before I say, I think I'll pass on the envelope stuffing. It's just, it's not my, it's just not me to, to do that. Um, and so I think, you know, over time you realize and you begin to recognize the situations and you're much better equipped to answer them because you have learned your values. You know what you care about. You know where you create value and what drains you of energy and, and what, what is not rewarding for you. And as soon mm -hmm. as you recognize those things, you can become much better at navigating the asks. Mm -hmm. I love that. And so as we start to wrap up, uh, I mean, I would say, look, this is going to be one of those questions where obviously feel free not to answer if you don't feel comfortable, but I am curious. Wow. So based on, based on all of your research and obviously, you know, we're talking now about the systems that you were thinking about the systems that you've created. Uh, how much do you still struggle with saying no? Much less than I used to. Yeah. It's, it's always hard uh, to navigate the best way to say no. So I, if, if I struggle, it's not with the decision because the decision comes clearly, but how best to communicate that no, to maintain the relationship with the other person, to, to be, as we talked about, as precise as we can. So if I invest time, it's not on the decision, but more the way in which I should deliver the response. Does mm. that make sense? 
Yeah, absolutely. So what you're essentially saying is it's not that uh, it's gotten, so it's gotten easier for you to say no, but it's also on the other hand, you've been a little bit or learn how to be more tactful about it. Because I guess ultimately, and this happens with a lot of us, we tend to overcorrect. So I've done this a million times where I go from, okay, now I'm first of all, just saying yes all the time. And then I'm just saying, no, I'm like, I don't care. Leave me alone. No, 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 no. Right. And you don't really have a way of thinking it through. You're just kind of like reacting to the fear. So it becomes fight or flight where it's either I just run away from it by saying yes, or I just become really aggressive and push the other person away and say no. no hmm. Neither of those are great strategies. No, they're pretty terrible. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Alan, uh, final questions for Vanessa before we wrap up. Yes. Uh, Vanessa, if we wanted to follow you, follow your work, and of course, buy the book, uh, where can we do that? So uh, I am on Instagram and Facebook, VanPat23. I'm on Twitter, VPatrick23. I'm also on LinkedIn, uh, VPatrick23, I think, uh, can be easily found. Uh, I have, I'm, a, I'm a professor at the Bauer College of Business, so you Google me. That's the first thing that comes up. Uh, and uh, I look forward to uh, hearing uh, from people interested in the work. My book can be found where, where books are sold. So Amazon, Barnes & Noble, everywhere. Awesome. Vanessa, Great. thank you so much for coming on. This, this was, was so fun. And yeah. by the way, when, when you said, oh, one of our final questions, I looked at the time. I had to say, wow, because it just really flew. <laughs> yeah. So it was a pleasure. Yeah, that was a great chat. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Talk Thanks. to you soon. Have a good night. Take care. Thank you. All right. So everyone, if you want to follow us, you can follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast on Facebook and on Instagram, on Twitter, where Seize underscore podcast. Like, subscribe, hit, hit the, the bell, bell on YouTube. YouTube. And again, thank you so much for watching and see you next time.